Hey, welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, healing hurts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Pastor John Mark. I'm so excited that you've connected to our page today. Be sure to grab a notebook, a pen, a paper, your phone, however you wanna take notes and get ready for today's message. Amen. Happy New Year. You all look so great today. I love the new year. And I want to ask this question. Ready? In all honesty, how are you doing? Isn't that a confusing question when someone asks that? It's so cliche. We do it all the time. It's almost what you ask people all the time. But let me ask you this question. Do you really care? When you say to somebody, hey, man, how you doing? Do you actually care? Because I'm going to ask this, okay? Because it's a confusing question to me. You ask me, hey, man, how you doing? Do you have the time to stand here and have that conversation? Do you want to know all the things that are going on in my life right now? Do you want to know all the things that I'm doing and all the goals that I have set for 2022? I mean, do you really want to know that? Or are you just being polite, saying what normal people say, hey, man, how you doing? And really, you don't even hear their answer. Because you expect to hear, I'm good, everything's great, I'm blessed, chilling. Come on, somebody, I'm just asking. We say these words of how are you doing, but are we actually standing there waiting to have this elongated conversation if they're not doing well? Are you ready to offer a solution and pray if someone says, This is actually the worst day of my entire life. I need help. We're starting a brand new series today called Emojins. Emojins, and it's a play off of the word emotions and emojis. Emojins. We're actually going to play a game next week called Kahoot. So make sure you have your cell phone with you. We will put up a way to access it. It's going to be a fun, interactive way. I'm sorry if you're watching online. You will not be able to play because you are on a two-minute delay. Uh, it, it just ain't going to work out that way. But we, next week, we want to identify some of the emotions that we feel and we are experiencing. But I want to under, you to understand something about emotions, Because you can pretty much see people's emotions all over their face. As hard as people try to hide it, you can see emotions. Even if they don't have a happy face or a negative face, you can almost sense their energy. They have a negative energy. Like the room just got dimmer because this person walked in. Or the room got lighter because this person walked in. I want you to understand this. God gave us emotions. Emotions are from God. Emotions are from God. How we use those emotions can sometimes look like the devil. Huh? But I want to take a few weeks here, and I want to go look at the emotions of Jesus through scripture, and to see maybe if we can't interact with the world and others a little bit more like Christ. I was amazed to see that Jesus expressed 39 different emotions in the Gospels. 39 different types of emotions. I didn't even know there were 39 types of emotions, but Jesus demonstrated 39 types. And what I want to do today is start this series on emotions by looking at Jesus and seeing if maybe we can act more like him. Looking at what he feels toward us. And I believe that that can help us express healthy emotions toward others. Can anybody in here use help having better emotions? Yes? And then the other half are lying. Today today we're going to look at Luke's gospel. And uh, to give you a little bit of context, we're going to start in verse 11. Jesus had just finished preaching 
his famous sermon called Sermon on the Mount. Anybody ever heard that one before? He's just got done doing that. And in verse 11, it says this. Soon after, soon after he had done this, Jesus went with his disciples to a village of Nain. And a large crowd followed him. A funeral procession was coming as he approached the village. And the young man who had died was a widow's only son. Say only son. That's important. All right, that's important. She's a widow who only had one son. Okay, important fact. Let's follow this. And a large crowd followed from the village, was with her, when the Lord Jesus saw her. Say, he saw her. He saw her. Have you ever wondered if God sees you? Have you ever wondered if God hears you? Have you ever wondered if God knows anything about your life or if you're just doing this all by yourself? Have you ever questioned Christianity to say, man, am I even in the wrong belief system? Could I be absolutely wrong? Is there something else out there? Jesus saw her. And then here's the emotion. Ready? His heart overflowed with what? Compassion. Compassion. His heart overflowed with compassion. I want you to understand this, that we see people sometimes and we may feel, aw. You may see a sick puppy dog on TV when they're trying to raise money for the ASPCA. They, aw, somebody needs to give that dog a meal. I'm going to give $10. That's not the compassion that Jesus felt. That's not what this word means. We're going to discover what this word compassion means, what he felt, what his emotion was. Watch, it goes on to say, he looked at this woman and he said, don't cry. What do you mean don't cry? My husband's dead. My only son is now dead. What do you mean don't cry? And, and, and I don't think that he was telling her, don't express emotion. I don't think that's what he was saying in that moment. I think what Jesus was saying in that moment is, if you knew what I knew, if you knew what I knew, Instead of me having to match your emotion, which he was doing, you would match my emotion. If you knew what was about to happen, you wouldn't be crying the way you are, you'd be rejoicing. If you knew who you just ran into, you wouldn't be crying. If you knew the hope of bumping into Jesus, you wouldn't be crying. Then he walked over to the coffin and he touched it, and the bearer stopped. Young man, Jesus says, I tell you, get up. And the dead boy sat up and began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. Luke says this. Luke goes on to tell us this. Great fear swept the crowd, and they praised God, saying, a mighty prophet has risen among us, and God has visited his people today. The power of Jesus is expressed through sincere and deep compassion. He felt compassion. And let's visualize this if you can. Jesus walks up and there's a funeral procession. It's not like ours today. They weren't having cars and their lights on and traffic stops on. No, they have to walk this thing. All right, so it's a crowd of people walking, and, and they have this boy in, 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 they're calling it a coffin, but it's not like our coffins. It's it's a flat, it's a stretcher. It's a stretcher on wheels. So his body is out, maybe just a flat piece of wood. He's wrapped up. They're taking him somewhere. And we know this, that we know from history that it's not uncommon for people who are mourning to hire professional mourners in this time. They would hire people to come cry and, and do something called wailing. And people would just scream and be hysterical and they would have tambourines and, and noisemakers and just do this big, big demonstration of sorrow. We also know that it prob- he probably died within the day because they didn't have embalming or anything like that. They would try to bury the body within a day or so. We don't know anything about this mom We know that she's a grieving single mom. We don't know how old she is. We don't know how her husband died. Was it an accident? Was it some kind of sickness? We we don't know how her husband died. 
We don't know how old the boy was. Was he a young man? Was he a boy? He's probably a little younger than Jesus because the way that Jesus speaks to him. All we know is that he has died within the day or so so that they could get him in the ground quickly. So if you can imagine, you've got this young mom who's already lost her husband, this boy's father, and now she's a widow and she loses her only son. Emotional, overwhelmed with grief. It's her deepest pain. Her, her greatest fear is realized. She does not have a husband. She's now lost her only son. And verse 13 tells us this. And in that moment, in the worst pain of her life, the Lord Jesus saw her. He saw her. Hey, let me tell you, if you're quarantined right now, he sees you. He sees you. Come on, somebody. Even if you're angry at the status of what's happening, even if you believe everything's a lie, he sees you. He sees you. He sees what you're going through. He sees the, your emotional state. He sees the thoughts. He understands. He saw her. And what's really interesting is that there's over 40 references in the Gospels that were told that Jesus saw someone. Jesus saw someone. That's funny to me. Because we would think, didn't he see everybody that he walked by? Didn't he see? Hey, uh, th think of these things, right? Jesus is walking through a crowd, and he says to his disciples, who touched me? And his disciples says, how sayest thou, who toucheth thee? Everybody's touching you. He said, no, 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 I felt virtue leave me. So a bunch of people touched him, but only one received a miracle. Right? Jesus is seeing everybody, but he only saw 40, according to Scripture. There was 40 moments in which it was like something about this has caught my attention. He doesn't just see her with his eyes, but he notices her. You know, just being seeing something and noticing it? You, you, you ever, come on, husbands and wives. W wives are going to say that their husbands can look but never see. Hey, honey, where's the toilet paper? It's right on the shelf of the thing. No, it's not. I don't see it. And your wife walks over there, opens the door, and it's right where she said it was. It's like, ah, if it was a snake, it would have bit you. <laughs> have the ability to look but not see. And this wasn't one of those things like Jesus sees her. He looks on, and he doesn't just look, but he sees. And he doesn't just see, but he sees her. He doesn't just see death, but he sees her. He doesn't just see pain, he sees her grief. Come on. And he matches it. He takes his emotion and he matches it. He feels what she feels, and his compassion matches her grief. Come on. And the Lord saw her carrying her only son, to a grave. Could this not be a type and shadow of what would happen to Jesus pretty soon? That the only son of God would be carried to a grave to be buried? And I think what Jesus was trying to say to this mom when he said, don't cry, is your son's story is a lot like my story. I'm going to show you in your son's life what's going to happen in my life. So I begin to think, what emotion did Jesus feel when he saw someone in deep, profound pain? What Jesus felt is the very same thing that he feels whenever you're hurting. If there's someone watching online that you've been dealing with depression so bad that you can't even leave your house... I'm telling you that the heart of God hurts when you hurt, that he knows what you're experiencing. Whenever you're praying and you're praying because your child is making crazy decisions and you're aching and hoping and believing that your child will be okay, Jesus feels the very same things that you're feeling when you're hurting and the exact same way that he feels the pain for this woman. And when the Lord saw her, say he saw her. When the Lord saw her, his heart overflowed with compassion, which means this, there wasn't enough room in his heart to contain all of the emotion he was feeling for her. If it overflowed, 
It means his heart was full to capacity. And I want to take a moment and explain this to you. This word compassion is the Greek word splagna. Say splagna. It's pretty, pretty fun to say, right? S-P-L-A-G-N-A, splagna. And this word means to feel the pain or feel the compassion from your gut, from your intestine. And that's kind of why it sounds like splag, like splag, ah, like gut, stomach, intestine, gut feeling. And there's no stronger word in the Greek language to represent this depth of compassion. So... Run a scenario with me, and I like to do this. Close your eyes for a second. I'm not going to do anything weird. You're driving down the highway, and you see a car accident, and it's a bad one. You can tell people are hurt pretty bad. The cars are wrecked. The closer you approach, you see EMS workers performing CPR on one of the people laying on the side of the road. There's multiple bodies, but they're performing CPR on one. And your heart hurts like, dear God, Lord, help them. Lord, send your ministering angels. Intervene on their behalf. Heal them, Lord. I pray life over them. So you feel this. The closer you get, you recognize one of those vehicles. It's one of your family members' vehicles. And the closer you get, you realize that the one they're performing CPR on is a close loved one. It changed, didn't it? You can open your eyes. It changed, didn't it? Knowing that it was just somebody and you're going to do a Christian drive-by, Lord bless them, versus recognizing it's your child, it's your spouse, it's your parent, it's an aunt, it's an, it changes things. It changes things. It goes from, oh, Lord, to, oh, my God. Splagna. Splagna. The deepest form of pain and compassion that you can feel. It's the depths. It's hurting from the gut, from the inside. It's when the Bible says that, th that there's groanings that cannot be uttered, the Bible says. That's, that's what this compassion is. I'm hurting because you're hurting. I'm recognizing where you are today. Listen, I want to tell you something today. This might be your first new year without a loved one, and you're hurting. I'm telling you, Jesus understands where you are. He's hurting with you. You may be fearful, not another year of this same thing. I'm so tired of it. Jesus understands. He did three years of ministry where he kept fighting the same idiots over and over and over again. He says, God, is this ever going to change? Am I ever going to make things better? Jesus noticed, and he felt in his bowels, in his gut, and he cared. I don't know who needs to hear this today, but Jesus knows what you're going through, and beyond knowing, he cares about you more than you could ever imagine. He cares about you more than you could ever imagine. He sees your pain, he hears your heart, he hears your cries, he knows that you may feel desperate, he knows that you can't catch your breath, he knows that there's somebody right now who's watching us and, and, and you're concerned because you've got some kind of diagnosis or you tested positive. I'm telling you, he's there with you. He's there with you. When your heart is pounding and you feel anxiety and you can barely find that breath, he knows and sees you. When you don't know if you're going to be laid off or find your next job, when you feel anxious about that, when you feel frustrated, the Lord sees, he notices, and he cares. If you're angry about politics, he understands. He stood before Pilate. He knows what it's like. Jesus sees this grieving mom. He hurts with her and he grieves for her. And then verse 13 says, don't cry. Don't cry. He walks over to this coffin, it says, and he touches it. Now, we have to understand this for a moment. He touches this, and it's shocking. It's shocking. Everything stops. Because this is completely scandalous. 
This is unheard of. You don't touch a dead body. You don't touch a coffin. You instantly become ceremonially unclean. You then have to go through a cleansing process because you have touched a dead body. You're done. Like, it's scandalous. It's just this gasp. <gasps> this gasp comes across all the Pharisees, all the people that were there because they had these laws that you can't do that. He was breaking the law. Jesus is prophet. He claims to be the son of God. Now does something spiritually unclean. Listen to what I'm saying. He's claiming to be the son of God. He's done all these miracles, and now he goes and does something that's dirty, unclean, disqualified. When Jesus touched the coffin, what he did was he crossed the line. He crossed the line. He went too far. You could have raised it from the dead from back here. You could have spoke a word and he'd come back to life. You didn't have to go touch him. You didn't have to go touch dead things. You didn't have to go there. Just you went too far. You crossed a line. I love that Jesus crossed the line. I love it. I love that he went too far. I love that he crossed the line. I love the fact that he broke the rules. And he wasn't breaking political rules. He was breaking religious rules that never actually aligned with what he wrote. Okay, we got to get that. Every time religion would draw a line, Jesus would cross that line. Why? Because love crosses lines. Come on, somebody. You know, you know when you were dating that girl who eventually became your wife, you would drive three hours just to make out with her to drive three hours back. You liar, you know it. You know, you hang up first. No, you hang up first. No, you hang up first. And you'd be mad embarrassed if anybody saw that weird stuff that you said because love crosses lines. Love does silly stuff. Love does foolish things. Love crosses lines in whatever line you feel right now that has maybe kept God at a distance from you. Whatever line you've drawn because maybe you don't know where God stands and how much he loves you. I want you to notice that Jesus wants to cross the line today. He wants to cross the line that you've drawn. You see, what distorted religion does and religiosity and legalism is it draws all these lines to make it hard for people to get to God. It should not be hard to get to God. It should not be hard to get to God. And the tragedy is that the very thing that I've kept some people away from God is the thing that he says, I want to heal that. I want to heal that. I want to be in that moment and in that experience with you. Jesus didn't want any lines. He didn't want any external rules to keep people from experiencing him, his love, and his grace, his power. And that's why here at Family Church, we don't draw lines to keep people out. We're not sitting here drawing lines to keep people out. We're saying how, listen, 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 listen. The church that wants to say you have to obtain a certain place of spirituality before God can accept you, just think about this for a second, actually is saying we want more people to go to hell than to go to heaven. The only stumbling block there needs to be is Jesus Christ and him crucified. What are you going to do with the fact that the only son of God gave his life for you that you might have eternal life, accept it or not? That's the only stumbling block. That's it. Now, after I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, I'm kind of signing up to let my life represent that. We want to see that. We want to see fruit. We want to see improved life. And that's what this sermon series is about. I'm telling you this. You will not be and you cannot be spiritually healthy and be an emotional train wreck. I've grown up in church where people thought they were so spiritual, but their emotions were a wreck. 
Come on, listen, can I just be facetious for a minute? Do you really think God wants you crying every worship service? Oh, God, it's just so good. Get your emotions under control. Let the joy of the Lord be your strength. What are you crying about? Listen, there are times that we cry. There's times that we do cry. There's times that we do experience pains and regrets and sorrows, and we bring that to the Lord. But dear God, if my wife cried every time I made out with her, I'd be out. I can't do this. This is horrible. This is horrible. Give me a giggle. Give me a laugh every now and then. Like, let's have some fun. Do you hear what I'm saying, somebody? So Jesus ignores the religious policies and he touches the coffin. He might perhaps have even touched the boy's body. We don't know, but there was no boundaries and no rules that could keep Jesus from touching his life. I'm telling you right now, there's no rule or regulation that can keep Jesus from touching your life today. There's nothing that's going to keep him out. Come on. And just as the crowd gasped, I love this. Just as the crowd gasped, I can't believe he did it. There was an even bigger gasp. As Jesus touches this boy's body, this boy gasps. As life comes back into his body, as breath comes into his lungs, he gasps. He sits up and he begins to speak to Jesus. I want to tell you this, whatever feels dead in your life today, Maybe, maybe even you thought you were going to have some great goals for 22 and because of the way the year's already started out, you've already, oh, it's going to be another 21. Don't, don't let those dead words come out your mouth. That's death, man. That's a false prophecy. I'm telling you right now, it's a false prophecy. I render those words powerless. 22, best year of your life. 22, best year you're done. Man, if you speak doubt, you speak unbelief, you're creating limiting beliefs. You're creating negative emotion. Jesus wants to touch your life. He brings dead things back to life. Just one touch, just one moment, just one word, just one moment of faith brings things back to life Again, and it's almost impossible to describe what Jesus did for this widow. You got to understand the times that they were in. If a woman's husband died, then her firstborn son had to take care of her. They couldn't work. Now her only son is dead. There's no one to provide for her. So she's now either condemned to a life of begging. That's option one. Or option two, she's condemned to selling her body to do unthinkable things. Those are her two options in this culture and in this time. So you can understand beside the fact of her devastated and gut-wrenching grief for the loss of her son, her life is over. She is in absolute despair. So you can't even understand what Jesus does for her by bringing her son back to life. He doesn't just bring love back into her life, but he brings provision back into her life. He brings finances back into her life. He brings security back into her life with one touch. One touch. He does all of this. And it's my prayer today that someone who feels anxious, someone who feels afraid, Someone who feels bitter or irritated or agitated, you're always on guard. Someone who feels unsettled, that this morning, the first Sunday of 22, you would not accept defeat. You would not accept a negative report. You would not accept this life that you think you're seeing in front of you for another year. But you would have eyes to see. You would hear the Lord Jesus say to you this morning, don't cry. Don't cry. Because if you see what I see, if you hear what I hear, if you knew what I knew about what I wanted to do in your life this year, 
you wouldn't be devastated. You wouldn't be depressed. You wouldn't be saddened. You'd have a hope. You'd know my plan. You'd pursue it. I, I want to encourage you this week, this week, take an hour at some point this week and get completely silent. Drive your car somewhere, go to an overlook, get completely away from everybody where you can get alone with God. Do not turn on worship. Don't turn anything on. And with the purest intentions and the purest heart, say, Lord, I'm here. The next 60 minutes are yours. What would you like to do in my life this year? And don't think about anything else. Don't try to make something up. Get a notebook out. Don't even have your phone. Don't type it in your phone. Get a piece of paper out so you get no distraction. I'm going to go even further on this because I'm feeling this moment. Maybe you don't even know how to do that yet because you need to hear this first. In that silent moment, Lord, I'm here. Asking this, do you love me? Because until you hear and know that God loves you, you won't have the confidence to ask the next question. What would you like to do in my life this year? And what he speaks to you, write it down and let it be part of the goals that you set for 22. Now, how are we going to make these things? Lord, how do I partner with you to make these goals happen? What do I need to do in my life to make these goals happen? Maybe it's getting up a half hour earlier and working on those goals. There might be some things that you need to adjust. Maybe it's not so much TV at night. Maybe it's after you put the kids to bed. It's not TV. We're going to read. Whatever it is, how am I going to partner with you, God, to accomplish things? And I'm telling you right now that he wants to bring dead things back to life again. He wants to bring dreams and hopes back to life in your reality this year. And listen, this isn't a fluff sermon. This isn't a fluff. I could preach a fluff sermon, trust me. This is more prophetic sermon. This is one of those things where, where as a spiritual leader, I'm taking charge on a quest and saying, we're clearing and forging some new ground. Hear the voice of your God as you follow Joshua, as you follow Jeremiah, as you follow Moses, as you followed Abraham. Follow the word of the Lord. Judge it. Judge the word. Not, not, not the presenter of it. Judge the word. Does this bear witness with what God wants to do in your life this year? And if it does, then we need to move. We need to make some moves. We need to move forward in the kingdom calling that God has placed in our lives. Father, we come to you today. And Lord, I pray that you would have touched the hearts of your people. That you would have reminded us who you are in our generation. That you're writing scripture even now as to what you want to do in this generation. So God, here we are, send us. Speak to our hearts, lead us. Give us wisdom beyond our years and let us walk in an anointing that the world has not seen in decades. Help us to see the way you see, hear the way you hear, operate the way that you operate. Lord, whatever it is in our lives that needs to move, in order to make more room for your overflow, I pray that we would do those things. Help us to consistently and persistently chase after the dreams and the visions and the goals that you've laid before us. Lord, I pray today that if there's any hurting among us, if there's any hurting online, that the peace that surpasses all understanding would overtake their heart and their mind today, that they would be in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. We thank you, Lord, today for your healing power sweeping through this land. Fear has no place in our lives, but hope, faith, and trust in you. Help us to have wisdom. Help us to apply the things that we know that we can follow after you in Jesus' name. If you're here today and you need prayer for any reason, we will have prayer team members available for you. If you are going through something in your life that you need counseling or you need a breakthrough or there's a habit that's trying to come back up in your life, 
We have care members and, and staff available for you to set up appointments or to come check out our Thursday night Celebrate Recovery program. My prayer is this. Have you ever heard of your EQ, your emotional quotient? My, my heart for you this year is that you would increase your EQ in 22. Your EQ, your emotions. That emotionally, we would, our emotions would match our spirit. A strong spirit, the Bible says, will sustain you bodily, but a wounded spirit, who could bear? I would pray that we would not operate in wounded emotions, but we would operate in healthy emotions that would match the, 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 the strength of our spirits, and we're going to help you and work, work you through that throughout this year. Father, we thank you today. Your word will never return void. Bless the works of our hands and everything we set them to. We are blessed coming in. We'll be blessed going out in Jesus' name. Love you. Thank safe. you for watching today's message. My name is Ashley, and if this message has made an impact in your life in any way, I'd like to ask you to do a couple of things. First, we want you to like and subscribe to our channel and join us right here every Sunday at 9.30 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. The next thing I'm gonna ask you to do is take a next step on your journey, and we would love to help you do that. You can head on over to FamilyChurchNY.com or email us at team at FamilyChurchNY.com to get started today.